Let's read. God's word begins John chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. A number of years ago, I was moving with my family, actually moving here, and when we got on the road, me in a moving truck and my wife in our van, We were about an hour and a half, 90 miles or so down the road when my wife called me and reported that something bad was happening to our van. She didn't know exactly what it was, but she knew enough to know this is not normal. Uh, Something's happening that's dangerous. We need to pull over immediately. And so we did with our whole entourage, the moving van, the car being towed behind the moving van, and our minivan limping into a Honda parking lot. So we pulled into this lot. We went in and they diagnosed the van and they came, which I assume they tried to look sad. I'm sure for them it's not actually sad, but they were, they were trying to be uh, commiserating. It was bad news. It was bad news. We were an hour and a half away from our home. Everything we owned that we hadn't trashed in order to fit into the moving truck was in the moving truck and the van was dead. It was toast. The transmission had died. It had left us stranded. And they said, "Uh, I'm sorry, we can't simply fix this. This thing needs to be overhauled. And then I had a choice that they began to present to me. You could get a newer van today. (laughs) I wasn't planning on a van exchange today. I was planning on a day of travel and a hotel or house at the end of the day, and that's what I was planning on. But they wanted to offer a a van exchange, or at least I assume they were willing to take my car. I don't know what the actual figure was, but it would have been sad and pathetic, actually. It would have been uh, nothing, probably, I assume, because of the deadness of my van at that point. But, 
but what they were wanting to emphasize was what I could get. You could get a new van, a newish van, a van that is not dead, a van that will fill you with joy and happiness and will make your children comfortable and your wife happy and will sustain you all the way. It won't die. It was this amazing exchange they were willing to offer. Trade in your sadness for joy seemed to be the point of it. Trade in your sad, pathetic, dead van, and the exchange will give you the joyful experience of that new car smell. Trade in your sadness for joy. Now, the catch, of course, was this was not going to be an even trade. <laughs> they weren't willing to only take my dead van. They wanted that and some of my lifeblood as well. They wanted both of those things in exchange for the joy of a new van. Well, the exchange point is where I see a familiarity in this verse and actually a better kind of exchange. There's an exchange that takes place in this verse and it's, it's, it's a trade-in that is offered to us as well this morning. It's a trade-in. It's a trade-in. It's, it's, it's an exchange that Mary needs but that she is not immediately discerning. She needs the exchange, but she's not discerning that it's possible. This exchange is actually much better because it comes at no cost to her. It comes at no additional price tag. It's a straight exchange. Exchange your grief and doubt for something else, something different. But Mary, like many of us, is unwilling initially to make this exchange. She holds on for a while, understandably, to her grief and doubt. She holds on to her tears. She wants to hold down, hold on to her broken heart. She's not ready yet to exchange it. She doesn't see what's being offered in return. But the point of this passage, I think, is to present her story to us and invite us to make that exchange this morning, to receive something in exchange for the tears of doubt. I want to make two points to walk through this passage. Relate to the tears, relate to the tears, and receive the joy. Relate to the tears and receive the joy. First, let's look at Mary and relate, relate, connect to her tears. If we don't connect to Mary's tears, if we don't see ourselves in Mary's tears, we will not receive the joy we are intended to receive. Many of us have heard of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have affirmed that as doctrinal truth, and yet often we don't apply that truth to the tears that Mary is shedding and that we shed and experience often on a daily basis. Often, often the joy we are intended to experience because of the truth of the resurrection does not penetrate the tears that flow out of our heart similar to the tears that Mary is shedding by that tomb. We must relate to Mary. So relate to the tears. Verse 11 says, Mary stood <coughs> weeping outside the tomb. She had already discovered it was empty. She had already run to Peter and John. They had already returned, but she lingers. She lingers in her grief outside of the tomb. And then as she is weeping, she stoops to look into the tomb. Now, we, we don't uh, need to condescend to Mary as she doesn't come to a conclusion of faith here. It is entirely reasonable, isn't it, that she would assume somebody has stolen her dead master's body out of this grave. This is a reasonable doubt. This is not a kind of uh, extreme, uh, atheistic, kind of defiant doubt. I refuse to believe. Now, this is a very reasonable doubt. This is reasonable. Wouldn't that be the first place your mind would go? Somebody's taken it. How could they do that? What kind of person would take a body? Very reasonable doubt. But this reasonable doubt is so stubborn. It resists the escalating evidence that's presented to her. She looks into the tomb, it says, and she sees two angels sitting there. Now, the text just kind of passes over that point. It doesn't emphasize it in any significant way. Now, we know from other passages that she was afraid of them, 
but it doesn't spark in her mind the thought that something supernatural could have happened to Jesus. Why? Well, because her reasonable doubt is stubborn. It's stubborn. The evidence against her doubt mounts as the angels ask her a question. They say to her in verse 13, Woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And as John often does in the Gospel of John, this question is packed with irony. Irony, there is a meaning behind the obvious meaning, and you never understand John unless you're looking for the irony. You have to understand irony if we're going to understand John. What's the meaning behind the meaning? Well, the obvious meaning is this is a normal thing to ask a a distressed person. Oh, why are you crying? As though the angels just simply need to hear a cause. But the meaning that John intends us to hear is simply found by asking in a different way. Why are you weeping? There's a mild exhortation, certainly an invitation in the question itself. It's not just, oh, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? The gentle invitation is, is there a cause for you to be weeping? Is there good reason for you to be weeping, Mary? But Mary's reasonable doubt is stubborn. She returns to her reasonable explanation. They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. She turns from the angels and away from the tomb, and she encounters Jesus himself. Jesus himself. And John is such a master storyteller. What he does is he, he sort of elongates the tension. He, he draws it out. You, you're, you're, as the reader, you're waiting to see when is Mary going to see what is right in front of her? When is she going to believe what she sees? But, but John draws it out. Even to two additional questions because Mary doesn't even recognize Jesus. Why? Because she's reasonably doubting that someone could rise from the dead that she had just seen die on a cross a few days before. She reasonably doubts that. And she's grieving. She's sad. She has suffered watching her master and her Lord, her hopes and her dreams, the one who had delivered her from demon possession. We find out in Luke that this this was her whole life and her whole life had died. And so what is she trying to do? Well, she, she has the assumption of reasonable doubt. Those who die stay dead. And so she's going to make the most of it. I can at least honor him. Mary is is not some sort of religious ingrate. She's not a, an, an atheistic pagan. No, no, she's, she's a very devoted woman. She's a worshiper. She loves Jesus. She adores him. She wants him to be honored. So she accepts the reasonable doubt that he's still dead, but she's determined, at least let me honor him in his death. He's at least worth that. She sort of settles... She settles for the most she can make out of a doubting existence. That's why she's crying. She loves him. She doesn't believe in all that he is, but she loves him and she wants to make the most of it. And I can relate to those kinds of tears. Tears of making the most of it and then being disappointed. Tears of reasonable doubt. Not outrageous doubt. Not extreme doubt. Not defiant doubt. Reasonable doubt. It, it, it's reasonable to be disappointed in this moment. It's, it's reasonable. It's natural. It's, it's rational to be disappointed. And I can relate to those kind of tears. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed at what has happened. I'm I'm disappointed at the the triumph of evil again. I'm, I'm disappointed that once again, life seems bent against me. Even when I'm trying to do the right thing, something evil has happened again. It seems as though evil has triumphed. I'm trying to make the most of it, but even that is taken away from me. I am disappointed because the man I put my hope in for this life, 
I, I'd assumed he would provide this life kind of comfort. Mary probably saw Jesus as a, a human Messiah, a human deliverer, as many of her contemporaries would have. She trusted him. She looked at him. He was a hero. He was a deliverer. He had obvious power from God to do miraculous things. But now, like all of the powerful prophets before him, he had gone away. And now even his memory is being taken from her. This is reasonable doubt. After all, Abraham died, and Moses died, and Joshua died, and Isaiah, and Ezekiel, and Elijah, they all were gone from this earth. The moment has come. Jesus' questions press the invitation into her tears. Woman, why are you weeping? And the even more important question, whom are you seeking? Whom are you seeking? Mary, you feel the irony in the question. Whom are you seeking? Are you seeking only the man that you saw die, that you assumed was just this powerful prophet, this marvelous teacher who cared for you and delivered you and exhibited God's power? Is that who you're seeking, Mary? Because that kind of person, it would be reasonable to assume that he is still lying somewhere as a corpse. Is that who you're seeking? But the underlying question that John presses through the question of Jesus is, aren't you in need of someone more than that? Are you seeking someone more powerful than sickness, more powerful than religious agnosticism are you seeking someone more powerful than hypocrisy or are you seeking someone more powerful than the curse of death itself who are you seeking jesus discerned in mary a need to see him as greater it was precisely her reasonable limitations her reasonable doubt about jesus not an unaffectionate doubt not a defiant doubt an affectionate worshipful but reasonable doubt about who he was that led to these kinds of stubborn tears and jesus wants her to see more jesus wants to give her an exchange not a bad day for a better day. A hopeless day for a new day. Who are you seeking? Her doubt remains, supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. We must relate to Mary's tears. Every Christian every day faces the temptation to live as though Jesus did not rise from the dead. You do and I do. Now, few Christians in this day and age, there are some, but, but few are tempted to deny the, the creed of the Reformation, the doctrinal truth of the Reformation, but you can believe something in your mind and your heart can be far away from it. You can affirm something in your creed and your affections and your emotions and your desires and your sight can be far away from it. And I think that's how I relate to Mary. A, a reasonable kind of doubting that pervades that I, even if unlike her, I, I know, technically I know that Jesus rose from the dead, but in my heart, in my life, I let doubting tears linger when I face the disillusionment and disappointment of daily life. I don't live life in light of a risen Savior. I live life with little distinguishment between a living Savior and a honored but dead Savior. I would never say that in my creed, but I am tempted by that. Let me give you some examples of how I think we do this. Do we ever accept lingering low-grade guilt as the normal sadness of life? Lingering low-grade guilt, not the moment of conviction, repent and receive forgiveness. I'm talking about the lingering low-grade guilt lingering uncertainty in the presence of God, lingering doubt that God will accept us in the end. That is 
being like Mary, living as though in his resurrection, Jesus did not demonstrate the defeat of the curse. And those tears that come from lingering low-grade guilt, I relate to Mary in that. Are we ever more depressed or angered by life disappointments like national politics than we are excited about heaven? Is there a grief in our heart that moves beyond sadness and into doubt, into a diminished faith? If so, I can relate to Mary. Does the Christian life ever feel more like a, a lifeless responsibility, like maybe putting flowers at a graveside, than it does a living relationship? If it does, then I can relate to Mary, and so can you. Because we're living as though he is only a memory to be honored rather than a living, breathing, conquering Savior. Religious devotion blinded by doubt is the source of Mary's tears. And perhaps it's the source of a lingering sadness in your heart as well. Now, not all tears, not all sadness is a result of doubt. Some sadness is a result of, of living in a fallen world in which we long to know Jesus and see him return and restore his creation. We long for evil to be vanquished. But suffering tears send, tend to, to fix our eyes on Jesus in faith. Doubting tears tend to turn us inward and away from Jesus. So we want to distinguish between the two. Doubting tears lead us away from trust in Jesus and into a kind of cycle of a vacuum of doubt that gets worse and worse and worse and that lingers in spite of evidence to the contrary in God's word. A, a kind of lifelong cynicism settles in as though Jesus didn't conquer the grave. We need to relate to Mary's tears. They are a lot more true of us than we might want to admit. Sometimes they happen when we experience suffering and question God's goodness. Sometimes they happen when we're inconvenienced and we don't know why. Sometimes they happen when people die and it results in a lifelong fear of death. Relate to Mary's tears. John knows. John didn't just write this for Mary's sake. John and the Lord guiding and inspiring him wrote this for our sake. He knows that those tears identify our heart as well. That stubborn inability to see the good news, to receive the exchange. Oh, that lingers in my heart as well. I can cry for a long time before I'm willing to finally humble myself and receive the joy that God intends us to have. Relate to Mary. If these experiences are ever true of you, you can relate to Mary's tears being blinded by a kind of natural reasonableness, a reasonable doubt about the living Savior and all that that means. Relate to Mary's tears, but secondly, receive the joy. Receive the joy. Receive the joy of a living Savior in exchange for the tears of doubt. Receive the joy of a living Savior in exchange for the tears of doubt. I love verse 16. Don't you love verse 16? I love it. I love it because it's so true in narrative form of all of the teaching of Scripture. Mary on her own is incapable of wiping away the tears of doubt in order to see what is right in front of her. Her natural, reasonable, religious doubt has blinded her to the truth. And yet a word from the Lord Jesus Christ penetrates her doubt, claims her as his very own, and she finally has her eyes open. Isn't it, isn't it such a, a pre precious truth contained in this passage that the Lord speaks her name and opens her heart? Because if you're a Christian, that's exactly what he did to you and to me. 
And that's exactly what he continues to do to believers who battle the lingering tears of doubt. He speaks your name, claiming you as his own. He said earlier in this book, my sheep hear my voice. Mary did not suddenly believe because of some abrupt logic in her mind that reasoned her way to a resurrected Savior. She believed because the word of God penetrated her soul. Faith comes by hearing. And it's still true today. Teacher, she says. Teacher can feel the joy infusing that the surprise the shock the faith the the tears are now changed to tears of joy there's a rejoicing that takes place it's 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 taken away the the doubt and the disillusionment and the make the most of a painful world and brought us in no a, a new world has now been created at the sight of the living savior d.a carson says anguish and despair are instantly swallowed up by astonishment and delight. Mary, he says, teacher. Now we know from the other gospels that immediately Mary went to his feet and just began to cling to them. It's an act of worship and devotion and worship and enthusiastic joy and humility before him. But Jesus discerns that Mary still needs her faith expanded. See, this is what Jesus is after in the resurrection. He is not merely wanting to give her a better day. And he perceives in her, and maybe in others like her, the potential to see his resurrection as, as just a better day, a longer life. After all, Lazarus had been raised from the dead. Mary had seen it. And so maybe Mary is just thinking, oh, you get to be around longer now. The temporary benefit of you is, is now going to be extended. You're really a powerful teacher. And so Jesus wants to expand her mind to understand the amount of joy she should be experiencing. This is not simply, I don't think this is a, a rebuke to her worship at all. I don't think this is a rebuke to her worship. I think this is a, a loving point to her that there is more joy to be had and for longer than she even now imagined. Do not cling to me, for, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, and here's the good news, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. There is the truth of the gospel contained in that message. He's expanding for Mary. Listen, there is more joy here simply than seeing me physically alive again. There is the joy of a new creation, a new day, a new permanent joy is being given to you, Mary, in exchange for your stubborn tears of doubt. A new joy, Mary, and here's what it is. I have established a new relationship with God. The one who died on that, on that cross under God's curse will now be at God's right hand. Think about the implications of that, Mary. Think about that. Think about the fact that the one who died on the cross, what the Old Testament said, meant that he was under God's curse, is now going to be at God's hand. How can one under God's curse be at God's hand? How can one under God's curse claim God as their father? How can he do it? Well, he can do it when he's the sinner's substitute, dying in their pl place and conquering death through the payment of it so that when he rises to heaven, he invites every believer to know a sin-free access, guilt-free access to God himself. Mary, Jesus says, it's not just a better day. It's a new day. It's not just a day for the continuance of the same old religious devotion separated from God. It's a new day where God, my God, and my Father have become your God and your father. Receive the joy of the gospel, Mary. 
receive not just the fact of the resurrection, but what it means. And that's where I think we need to receive Jesus' word as well. Don't just rejoice in the fact of the resurrection, Mary, which is what she was doing when she was clinging to him. I believe the fact of the resurrection, and I'm excited about it. Jesus rose from the dead. He says, no, you you need to see more than that. Receive what it means. Receive what it means through this message. I, the one who died on the cross as a cursed man, am going to God's place, which means my my sacrifice has been fully accepted And since I go to be with God, where I go, you go also. The way I relate to God, you relate also. Welcome to the new day, Mary. Receive that message. Receive the message of a new relationship with God, proven by my resurrection. Not just the fact of it, but the fruit that flows out of the fact of it. Jesus' words have profound meaning for us. Because sometimes we, we act like we're wearing sunglasses at night. Have you ever had that experience? You have your sunglasses on and the sun goes down and at some point it penetrates the dull conscience of your heart and it's like, man, it is dark. You ever had that experience? It is, it is so dark. Why is it so dark? And you begin looking around and you notice that there are lights on, but they seem dark. Why is it dark? And then you realize something's wrong with my eyes. And then finally it connects. I have sunglasses on at night and you take them off and all of a sudden it's clear there is nothing wrong with the light everything's wrong with me Christians do that a lot we believe the fact of the resurrection but we live with resurrection sunglasses on that's what Jesus is saying to Mary not not just the fact of it what it means for you that I rose from the dead rose from the dead as a sinner's substitute rose from the dead having been cursed having been forsaken what does it mean that I rose from the dead from that death what does it mean for you it means that if I am going to ascend to the right hand of God all of the gospel promises of a new covenant have now been ushered in Mary take the glasses off Receive the joy of a living Savior. C.S. Lewis says, The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits, the pioneer of life. He has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met fought and beaten the king of death everything is different because he has done so here's the question this passage presses to us is everything different for you because he has done so is everything different for you everything different for you do do you view political challenge and sinful leaders differently because of what he had has done in rising from the dead do do you view your ongoing battle with sin and the temptation to live endlessly in the guilt of it differently because jesus rose from a substitutionary death do you view the temporary trials that call into question the kindness and goodness of god differently because jesus rose from the dead do you view things differently or do you allow those tears of doubt to linger sometimes in your soul like i do john piper says the best news of the christian gospel is that the supremely glorious creator of the universe has acted in jesus christ's death and resurrection to remove every obstacle between us and himself so that we may find everlasting joy in seeing and savoring his infinite beauty the creator of the universe has acted 
perfected in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection to remove every obstacle. I am going, he says, to my father and, and, and to your father, to my God and to your God. What's he saying? The relationship I have with God has now been extended to you through my death and resurrection. That is the new day. That is the offer. That is the exchange. So, exchange. Exchange it. Exchange your tears of doubt for the joy of a living Savior. Receive, receive this offer. Receive the joy of a living Savior, the joy of a living Savior, not simply the fact, the joy of a living Savior in exchange for the tears of doubt that linger. Receive the joy in exchange. Receive it. Receive it this morning. Receive the joy of a living Savior and what that means childhood towards God, eternity with him because our Savior is with him. And as Jesus said, where he goes, we will go also. Where is reasonable doubt bringing a sadness to your heart? Where? Where is it? Let's apply the resurrection to it. Where is it? Is it when you think about your sin? Receive the joy of a living Savior who defeated sin and death and guilt and through his death fulfilled the law against you if you've believed in him is it when you think about relational emptiness receive the joy of a living savior who is all that we need and has brought us into a family of god is it when you think about death i have a dear christian friend who spent years fearing for her own death and the death of her loved ones she knew it wasn't a fear she needed but she lived with it for years Receive the joy of a living Savior. Death is a shadow that passes over a believer as they walk into paradise. Is it present when you think about those that you know that linger in unbelief, not just doubt, but denial of the Lord Jesus Christ? The living Savior is able to call their name to. He's able to speak their name and open their eyes to. A dead Savior cannot do that. Sometimes I think we think about evangelism as though we're representing a dead Savior. We, we say you should believe in him as though we're saying you should believe in a historical figure. But the reality is we're just speaking to them, but he can call their name. Even as we speak, he can call their name. And no matter how long they've been lingering in doubt, when he calls their name, they will turn to him and say, Lord. Where is reasonable doubt bringing a sadness to your heart? Oh, that was my burden this morning as I studied this passage. Search out, search out the crevices of reasonable doubt, the tears of lingering doubt, not the tears of understandable suffering and longing for heaven. I'm talking about the tears of doubt that shade your life with a, a grayness that doesn't live in the joy of a resurrected Savior. Where is it? Where are those tears? Search them out and apply to them the truth of a living Savior. Is it present when you think of death and destruction and political chaos in this world or in this country? Is there a certain doubt about God that is present in your heart in that way? Is it, is it present when you, when you think about your children? Is there a, a, a reasonable doubt that he is able to save sinners? Where is there reasonable doubt like Mary had that needs to be transformed by the new day. Receive this morning. Receive. Redemption Hill, receive the joy of a living Savior. If you're a guest, receive the joy of a living Savior. If, if you're not a Christian, well, receive it for the first time. There's a living Savior who died to pay for sinners and offers you his death in payment for your sins and his life as the center of your world. Receive. Receive that this morning. 
You don't have to go on living as though you can attempt to honor God and be good to other people on your own. You can receive the good news of his gospel. Receive it this morning. If you're a Christian and you're lingering with the tears of doubt as though Jesus did not usher in a new reality for you, receive. Receive this morning. Receive the joy of a living Savior. It's an exchange. Take your broken-hearted sorrow. Wherever there is doubt, and exchange it. No extra cost. No catch. No price tag. Just the joy. Christ is risen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this incredible story that we can so relate to, Lord. And I pray right now that you would penetrate every heart in this room with the good, joyful news of your resurrection. I pray right now, Lord. I pray you would call names right now, Lord. I pray wherever there has been tears of grief and doubt and struggle against unbelief. Lord, I pray that the truth of your resurrection, all that it means, would penetrate those tears and would bring about a joy. Lord, we worship you as our living Savior who conquered death and guilt and the curse that wipes away our tears. Receive the glory, Lord. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many of you will know the church tradition that we seek to follow here at the end of Easter Sunday where a preacher declares Jesus Christ is risen and the church responds he is risen indeed. So we're going to carry that tradition forward. So as you respond, Jesus Christ is risen. Amen. Have a joy Filled Easter Sunday. We'll see you next week.